Gig Gab, episode 395 for Tuesday, September 5th, 2023. Folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians. Sponsors for this episode include factormeals.com slash giggab50, where you're going to get 50% off. We'll tell you exactly how to do that and why you're going to want to do that uh, in a little bit. For now, here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. Here, back in Napomo, California, it's Paul Kent. How are we today, Mr. Paul Kent? Doing pretty good. Had a nice, busy weekend. Did get um, Labor Day off and actually had a sat the Saturday of the weekend off. So I played Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Sunday. Uh, good good run. No house record gigs, all oh, wow. either solo acoustic or small band gigs. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it was fun. Got a lot of good music in, a beautiful weekend. And uh, I kind of like the clicking over the seasons philosophically. Like, you know, it's officially when the weather starts to change. But I like the idea that, September, kids are back in school, yeah. pace of life seems to change a little bit, and uh, I like that stuff. Yeah, 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 I mean, you're yeah, right, you're right. Officially, it's like the 21st or the 22nd or whatever when when we become fall, but but yes, with kids being back in school, even though I, I don't think either one of us has kids that are in school anymore, there's still that, like, it, it is a change of pace, sort of, it, it for society, and so, yeah, there, there's definitely that. We had... Um, we had the the best weather over Labor Day weekend that we have had all summer. It didn't rain. Maybe it rained like at 2 a.m. on Sunday morning or something. But otherwise, it was sunny and like in the 80s during the day and down in the 60s at night. It was the weather New England freaking deserved after the summer that we've had. Uh-huh. Yeah. And um, it just kind of worked out that I, I didn't have – any gigs Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, uh, Sky, our daughter's home from Italy where she lives. So she's here. Her home is in Italy. My home's here. Uh, but she's home for a few weeks and it was really nice to kind of have the weekend to, to just to chill. We didn't, we didn't go nuts doing anything, but I did have a gig on Thursday night. I actually had two gigs. I had to make Sophie's choice. Um, so I took the gig that I had booked first. My friend, Maddie, who used to play with us with monkey fist a bunch. And I've, done some duo gigs with him. He came back from Florida for a few weeks this summer. And so we had booked this gig on Thursday at this place called the dairy field, which is this golf uh, public golf course that with a restaurant and stuff, you kind of play on this deck overlooking the golf course. It's gorgeous up there. And we had that gig that we booked, I think back in March or something when he planned his trip. And then in the meantime, a bitter pill gig wound up getting booked for that same night. And of course, I just assumed the Dairyfield gig would get rained out because everything this summer got rained out. And so I figured it would oh, be fine. It'd all work out. Well, no, no rain. We had, so Bitter Pill played, I think Bitter Pill played as a three-piece on Thursday night because there were several band members who couldn't make it. But um, Monkey Fist played up on the deck and it was friggin' amazing. It really was, um, it was wonderful to play with Matt again. He's, he's, uh, he's a musical jukebox. He just plays, you know, he knows so many songs and he and John and I sing real well together. And we had our friend Jim Richardson playing with us too. So it was a four piece monkey fist. And, uh, I just, I, I don't know. It was, we, we had a great time just hanging out and playing and entertaining the crowd and entertaining each other. And, uh, and Maddie, Maddie really delivered. Sometimes gigs with Maddie can get off the rails. Um, because you know, he, he just, you, you say you have musical ADD. He has, a, he has a different brand of musical ADD. He will just play whatever songs come to mind. And uh, <clears throat> some, sometimes that can can get, it can get a little ragged at times. It did not on Thursday, but but at times it can, because it'd be like, oh, I half know that song. And then it's like, you know, we wind up playing seven songs in a row that we don't know. But uh, <clears throat> he had, but that didn't happen on 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 Thursday. We It wound up being kind of one of those magical nights that had, really good flow to it there was there was one moment i guess we were going to play that dave matthews tune ants marching and maddie likes to tune down to drop d for that and so he tuned down to drop d and 
he, you know, as soon as he's in drop D, he's like strumming chords to make sure his guitar like sounds right. And that launched him into something. I forget what the first drop D song was, <laughs> but it went fine. And then the second drop D song we, I thought would be Ants Marching. Nope, not yet. It was, he started playing uh, Black Water. And somehow by that point in the night, we had kind of decided to throw caution to the wind. We, we would, you know, we had, we had already played songs like Listen to the Music which, you know, harmony wise are a, a challenge. Um, and uh, what else did we play? Take it on the run, the Ario Speedwagon tune. You know, we were, we, we were taking chances and, and they were paying off for the most part. So we were a little confident and going in. And so when Blackwater started, it was like, all right, we're in. And it was just, it, it worked out great. Like we had enough of the harmonies in there and just everybody was listening to each other. It was, it was one of those, one of those moments. So after that, we played. We finally did play "Ants Marching," and then after that, Maddie launches into um, "Going to California," uh, Zeppelin tune. All cool songs, great songs. I know, and I, like none of us played with Matt on on the Zeppelin tune. We all just kind of let him go, and and like I had the best seat in the house because I got to watch him like just really truly deliver this. It was like holy crap, man! Like I've never seen you do that before. <laughs> and this this guy standing by the stage. Uh, you know, he was kind of like walking by, I think after smoking a cigarette or whatever. And he just kind of stopped and did stood there and watched Matt do the whole thing. And when it ended, he, he's like, Oh, that was really cool. <laughs> and I, I looked at him I'm like, yeah, that was really cool. <laughs> cool. Yeah, it was fun. It was, it was a really nice gig and it was nice to get to hang out with Matt again before he uh, heads back at the end of the month. Uh, so and then Jimmy Buffett this weekend, like we didn't play any Jimmy Buffett this weekend. It, I, we would, it, we would normally, like th there are Jimmy Buffett songs in the monkey fist set list, but we didn't get to any of them. And that, of course the monkey fist gig was Thursday night. So, um, I, we certainly didn't know at that point that Jimmy had passed. I don't think he had, I think it was, I think it was like Friday that he passed or something, but, um, but no, yep. we did not know. So do you play any Jimmy Buffett songs this weekend? Every, everyone I know. <laughs> and how many is that? Yeah. So we play, let's see. So I play solo. I'll play um, Pirate Lips at 40, and uh, he went to Paris. Yep. Um, I play uh, Come Monday. I play um, with the with the coffee house band. We play Margarito, of course, and um, a really cool one called um, Elvis Presley Blues. That actually is a, a Jillian Welch song that that Jimmy recorded. Hmm. That's Great cool. Tune. Yeah, I don't know yeah. that one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he, he had. It, I mean, he had a fascinating career. Obviously, um, I, 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 fascinating I, life. Fascinating life. Yeah, yeah. I mean, as he, uh, I think he only had that one one song in the top ten. But you know, he. We've talked about this on the show. He he lived and breathed that whole aspirational life, where where you know he would go on stage, and most of the people that were there wanted to be him. And, yeah. you know, it, we, we talked about him in cargo shorts, right? I mean, he, he sort of epitomized that whole thing and with the, the faded t-shirt and cargo shorts and, and he made it work and, and then Sammy stole it from him. Uh, and I, I read, did you read the, did you read the Bob Lift sets, uh, tribute to him? I did not yet read Bob Lift sets as tribute to him. I, yeah. Excellent. Yeah. I, I'm sure it was. I'm, I'm waiting and I just saw it come in. I was waiting for the, uh, reactions the responses to bob's thing because there's always interesting people who respond when when you know a a prominent figure in the music industry passes and so i'm curious to read those but i haven't read them yet because we're, we're here recording not, so there's not a bad thing said about jimmy buffett yeah. I mean, paul mccartney talks about how great he is and yeah. you know pure musicians talk about how great he is and yeah i mean a life well lived, I'll tell you. I forgot that I had that much success in that many different realms. Not to have more people taking shots at him is an amazing thing. I That's mean, fair. Having anybody taking shots at him. Yeah, yeah, it's fair. I mean, yeah, no, he, he, I, like, I, I never met him or encountered him. I never even saw him live, but um, everybody that talks about him says that he was a really genuine kind of guy. And yeah, yeah. and, and, great uh, legacy. Yeah, he owned a friggin' island. I mean, like, <laughs> he did pretty well with his whole, you know, aspirational brand. He, he built he sure that did. up pretty good. <laughs> I think um, 
Sammy Hagar's tribute was was fascinating. I'll I'll paraphrase it because I don't have it right in front of me, but it was something he talked about when he met Jimmy the first time, and uh, it was after Sammy had decided to embrace the beach bum look on stage as well. And uh, Jimmy said, "Oh, I know you. You're the guy who's trying to come for my job." And Sammy laughed and uh, he says, "Of course, Jimmy. We all want to be you." So you know, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good stuff. Yeah, man. Yeah. Did you play any Smash Mouth this weekend? Did not, although, like, you know, that band is from San Jose. And, and yeah. so a lot of people with first hand connections to Harwell, including one guy who I'm actually pretty good friends who actually was the last touring guitar, lead guitar player for Smash Mouth. Oh, wow. And so, yeah, he was hit quite hard. And again, yeah. another guy who had kind of a really a good guy reputation like a, you know just you know didn't didn't uh, pretend to be anything he was not got it was good at what he was yep. and just you know did it great camp who was another founding member of smash mouth again that band is from san jose uh, greg has some really good stories on on uh on facebook that he's been sharing about right. about steve harwell that's interesting to read yeah, yeah. I'll have to check that out. That's interesting. Yeah, he, um, Smash Mouth, I don't know if you booked him. I think it was an Apple developer party, but I remember they played uh, at, at some party at a Macworld Expo, but I think it was the 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 Apple developer party, not not one of yours, right? Could be. Yeah, yeah. I, I never booked him. My brother. I think it was your brother was who booked there, him. Booked him. I think yeah. your brother booked him for the Apple developer party. I think that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. 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 But I, good guy, you know. They're, they're, you know, between them, Christine McVie and Robbie Robertson, it's been, I guess that's the way it's going to be now, right? Yes. It, it, yes. It, it, the, the, it's going to keep happening. Yeah. That, that is sort of a fact of life, but, it, but you're right. We're, we're hitting that, that time where a lot of people that, uh, I mean, well, Harwell was, was young. He was only 56. Right. Yeah. I mean, and I mean, Jimmy Buffett was young too in in that sense i mean he was only 76 uh but you know i think i think it was cancer for both of them right that's what it what it's come I, out as i've so. heard skin cancer yeah for yeah that's right yeah yeah so liver cancer i think for steve harwell for harwell yeah exactly well hey we got a uh yeah. we got a a note from our last episode uh listener andy was listening to our discussion on tempo and, uh, and he shared, he says, when, uh, when Paul first brought up his question, the essence of which was, isn't the drummer, the one in the band who's in charge and needs to be responsible for tempo. And he says, I was ready to answer. But then later in the podcast, Paul answered his own question exactly as I was going to. And in the same vein of the discussion with Dave, that is, even if the drummer's solid and unwavering on tempo, but is playing with players, especially rhythm, guitar, or bass, who are pushing, wavering, or dragging, the band won't sound very good due to this tug of war. The push and pull just saps the groove away. So preferably, everyone is in tune with and versed in good tempo and timing. The bands with players that have this common tempo awareness often sound amazing. He says, I've played with tempo rushers and it's exhausting trying to constantly hold the reins back. And he's a drummer, by the way. Uh, he says, he, he goes into some stuff here, here which will get us into some gear gab, which I like. He says, so thank you, Andy. He says, uh, it seems like both of you guys manage tempo mostly by feel and do reasonably well, apparently. I used to play this way, but got frustrated listening back to gig recordings and shuddering at what I thought sounded good during the gig, but not so much later on when I listened to the recording. He says, so I now take a different tact and remove all the guesswork. I use Live BPM, which is an app on his phone mounted on his hi-hat stand along with a Tama Rhythm Watch metronome with pre-programmed tempos for every song we play, he says. The Live BPM app is just on all night long and is an easy way to check in. For those of you that don't know about Live BPM, we'll put links to all this stuff in the show notes. Live BPM uh, will listen to what's happening and show you what it interprets as the tempo, and it's really very good at doing that it sounds kind of magical but but it actually uh, works really really well so he leaves that on he says my set list has tempos listed for every song i click in for the whole band starts or i start a quick uh quiet hi-hat click at the proper tempo for uh, guitar or another instrument when they start the tune 
Collectively, the band can officially decide that we want to change the tempo of any particular song, but the aim is to not have to guess or risk starting a song that's not at the agreed-upon tempo. Agreed tempos are most commonly the same as the original album recording. Some bands, he says, I know, like to justify playing a little faster than the original, citing live energy. He says, I tend to disagree with that, as most hired DJs are playing the songs just as recorded, and I've never heard anyone at a party with a DJ say that the music didn't have enough energy. Um, he says, since using in-ears for the last couple of years, I've graduated to playing to the click in my monitor only. I use the same Tama rhythm watch connected through my Rolls PM 50 monitor amp. Again, links for all these things in the show notes. Uh, I use this for most songs, but not all for some songs. It's either not needed or I'll turn it off if it's ever getting in the way on some songs. I have an out of tempo pause or break. Then I'll restart the click once we get back in. Well, that's super advanced. Um, it says, regardless, the click helps keep the same feel between gigs, regardless of how high or low my energy might be on those days. Thanks for this, Andy. Yeah, I, that live BPM app, that would be an interesting thing to just set up and kind of keep as a, uh, just as a, a, you know, a guide or a, a, a confirmation, right? A nice little check. Well, what would you do if it, if you see it, if you were watching that and you saw your tempo starting to creep, would you try and deal with it and pull it back or yeah, just, I probably would. I mean, yeah. if I saw it, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's not like you, sometimes you notice that, right. You feel the tempo starting to creep and it's like either at the very least, unless you want it to creep, but if it's just happening and you're like, wait a minute, I feel like this is faster Then you, I, you know, I'll just kind of tug on the reins a little bit and at least keep it from creeping more. Right. It, it's not always a good idea to slow back down. If it's creeping up, slowing back down, depending on the energy of the room, that that can be a sort of an energy suck. So it'll be like, all right, let's yeah. let's not let's not let this get any farther away from us. So yeah, I think having that live BPM app in in the right scenarios would be, you know, an just an interesting uh, data point, right? Like, are we are we drifting? You know, where are we on this tune? I, like, I, I think that's kind of I think that's interesting. I, I like it. Are yeah. you pretty good if you know if you know a song supposed to be one ten? Are you pretty good? At Pulling one ten out of your out of the air and just playing it. Yeah, I'm pretty good with where one twenty is, uh, because of all the March stuff that I did, uh, you know, as a kid. So I can I can sort of maneuver from there. And then yeah, there are some songs like songs that like at a hundred. I know where that is, but but like I say that I have to really take a breath. I, I don't just hear it in my head. It's it's not like there is there is a thing that that is called perfect tempo kind of like perfect pitch where no matter what the scenario it, you know people with with perfect pitch can just tell you okay yeah, yeah l let me sing you a b flat and it's always a b flat because they see it like you and i see red there are i've never encountered someone or at least i've never had a conversation with someone that i know to have perfect tempo but i i, I know these people exist or at least i've heard that these people exist i don't have that i need so i i definitely am subject to adrenaline and other distracting factors misleading me unless I really take a breath and feel the song in my body. Like that's where I can really get to like, you know, you know, it's like, okay, great. Like now I'm starting to get there. And I think that was actually a little slow, but, um, I, it, you know, like that, and I'll listen to it. One of you will listen to it and email us feedback at giggabpodcast.com. You'll tell me in the moment, but that's it is I didn't take a breath. Like I just sort of did it. And that's where I get screwed up. I think that was a little slow. I'd be curious to to listen back and and have y'all tell me. <laughs> mm. But um, but yeah, it, you know, and 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 it's I've learned most songs. It's helpful to sing the verses, not the chorus, um, because the chorus is often like in my head. Sing the chorus, or even just softly sing it to myself. That the chorus can be misleading for most songs. It's it's the verses where I can be like, oh yeah, no, no, no. I gotta like it's gotta be a little slower, it's gotta be a little faster to find that tempo home and then and then start the tune. But yeah, it's sure. I, I I need that minute. How about you? Like when you're counting in a tune, do you do you have to take a second and just breathe through it? I've learned that some songs or some points of the show I have to remind myself to take to take a breath. Yeah. Right. But some some things are autopilot and it's pretty good. That's good. Well, that's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, if you're like me and your summer was full of gigs and maybe your fall is too, 
you're probably going to be looking for some wholesome, convenient meals for those jam-packed days and nights, right? Factor, America's number one ready-to-eat meal kit, can help you fuel up fast with their chef-prepared, dietitian approved ready-to-eat meals delivered straight to your door. These things are great because you get to save time and eat well and stay on track with a healthy lifestyle, right? You get to skip the extra trip to the grocery store with Factor, and you also get to skip the chopping, the prepping, and the cleaning up too, while still getting all the flavor and quality that you want and need. And what I love is that Factor's fresh, never frozen meals are ready in just two minutes. All you have to do is heat and enjoy and then get back to like plan a gig or maybe, you know, get to sleep after the gig, whatever it is. I've used Factor here at the house a bunch. We're actually going to start using it again because we're about to have our kitchen redone. And boy, it couldn't be a better alternative for us during this period. We don't want to have to eat out all the time. We want us to be able to save money, but... I, you know, we got to be able to just cook in the microwave because there's nothing left in the kitchen. It's fantastic. They've got 34 plus weekly flavor packed, fresh, never frozen meals. And they truly are ready to eat in just two minutes. So head to factormeals.com slash gig gab 50 and use code gig gab 50 to get 50% off. That's code G-I-G-G-A-B-5-0 at factormeals.com slash giggav50 to get 50% 50% off. And our thanks to Factor for sponsoring this episode. So, Paul, all, all good things evolve, right? And uh, the, the, one of the bands I play in Fling is, is seeing another step in its evolution here. Uh, our... Uh, lead guitar player Mike is taking a sabbatical. He's a teacher. He's taking a sabbatical this semester and going to spend some time in Europe, which is great. Um, and evidently, he's been thinking a lot about you know Fling and and his place in it. And he was going to think about that a lot during a sabbatical. But uh, but he told us recently that he is uh, not going to wait to make this decision until he gets back, he's going to make the decision to leave the band before he, uh, before he heads off. So fling is, but is evolving. I, I don't know exactly what that means. I, I think it means we're going to be a four piece. And I, I don't know what that means for fling either, but it's, uh, it's interesting. Uh Oh, did I lose you? I think I lost him after all this time. Amazing. Here. Oh, you're here. Here, I'm here. Okay, great. I I have questions. Yes, man. Yeah, I was I was I was shocked by your silence. Yeah. So Mike is a founding member of Fling. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, I I I think so. I would call him a founding member of Fling. I I was I was not in. I was not a founding member of Fling. I was brought in a couple of years into Fling's, maybe a year and a half into Fling's uh story yeah but mike certainly it was there before me i i'm i i think he's a founding member of fling yeah and 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 he was definitely there through you know what i would call flings had steps in its evolution you know we had uh the beginning of it where when i joined it was really just like bowling night i had just moved to new hampshire i was introduced to these guys it was like great you know, people my age, my demographic, you know, they live in the neighborhood. This is amazing. Sure. Right. You know, and wasn't gigging. I was gigging with other bands. This was just like one night a week we'd hang out. And then we started playing gigs and, and it, and then fling evolved uh, into a very, uh, you know, powerful juggernaut of a, you know, local seacoast of New Hampshire bar gigging band. And we were playing, uh, you know, two to five times a month and we were a well-oiled machine like fling was out there kicking ass it was it was great for a number of years like it was one of the most successful sustained gigging experiences of my life with with a, a given band i mean it was probably five years six years that fling was mm. just out there just like non-stop pretty much and yeah. uh and and we were you know we were great like we really got to a point where we were great and and Mike was responsible I mean obviously he played in the band he sang in the band but he also uh 
was the one booking 90% of those shows. So, you know, he was instrumental in making that happen both at the gigs and, and to set up the gigs. And, Mm -hmm. uh, and then, and then, and then we hit like COVID and obviously stopped playing, but fling had started to sort of peter out a little, like the, 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 intense gigging had started to peter out. Aaron had moved out of the seacoast, so it wasn't quite as convenient. Uh, and then COVID, yeah, obviously pressed pause on that. Yeah. But but then even during COVID, me, Mike and Russ Miles, the you know, the, the guitar player, he uh the three of us were all teaching at the University of New Hampshire that spring of 2021 when uh and the university was doing like they had I called it rapid PCR tests, right? Cause we were able to submit a test at nine in the morning and have the results by like 11 o'clock. And so we would do our PCR tests. And then on the same day, we coordinated our days so that we all felt comfortable coming to the studio and jamming and which was great. Yeah. That was probably the, the best part of that teaching experience for me, quite frankly, but that's a whole other story. But um, next question though. Yeah. Got another question. More, many, many more questions. Yeah, go. Sorry. How long if you looking back, how long have you been aware something's going on with Mike or something's coming about with Mike? Like, like, like this, I can't imagine his pronouncement now was a blindsided you, right? I mean, it, it's probably been brewing for a while in one way or another. And that, and that can mean, you know, overt, overt detachment from the group or, or subtle detachment, you're right. It could mean a whole bunch of things, but how long have you looking back now, have you realized Mike's been been, you know, wrestling with this idea? Yeah, it's a good question. I like Fling has been in flux. Say that ten times fast. Uh, for you know the last what really since COVID. Uh, let let's say you know like I said it started a little bit before that, but it's been a there's no been no real definition as to what Fling is like in any given moment. I think we could tell you what the definition is, but really the definition of a band is, is, you know, what has the last six months been or what has the last five years been or, you know, whatever, like it, it's the proofs in the pudding and the pudding of fling has been, you know, kind of churning, you know, we are, uh, we had COVID our before that Aaron, uh, who's still a member of fling and, and still very much a part of it, but you know, he moved, about an hour away and and was traveling a lot, still is traveling a lot for work. And then our bass player Burke left shortly kind of as COVID was starting to kind of ease a little bit. Uh, We brought in Jamie Bradley and that's been fine, but it, but there's been some really sort of intentional pushes like Russ really pushing us to be an originals only band, which is fine. But even that's been very rigid. It's like we're not going to play any covers, and so there there have been a lot of sort of things that that have have applied external pressure onto the what normally would just be sort of the organic evolution of a band. And so, I to, to it, it, this is my long winded way of answering your question. I think every one of us has felt a little bit my interpretation is every one of us has felt a little bit uncertain of the future of fling because there's been these external factors or even internal but but sort of forced factors of like this is how things are going to be it's like okay well let's see how that goes that's kind of how i embrace all of these things is well let's see how that goes because i've learned that sometimes you know, something will happen with a band and you'll think, oh, well, that's definitely going to kill this thing. And then it winds up flourishing or the the reverse. It's like, oh, well, yeah, things are going great. And then suddenly it's like, oh, that's over. Great. Ah, got it. No problem. You know, so I like this, you're, this was not a huge surprise in that there's been enough flux, but, but in a sense, it was a surprise because it was like, oh, all right. I, I didn't, I didn't see this coming but it's not shocking as right. it got dissected. If that, you know, if that makes sense, it, but it, it wouldn't have been shocking. I heard about this a couple of days before Mike sort of announced it to the band. He'd been talking to Russ about it. And Russ said, what do you think about fling as a four piece? And I didn't know what he meant, but I mean, I understood the math. Mm. I, I knew he meant one less member, 
but I didn't know yeah. which one. I was like, well, are we talking about Aaron leaving? What, Jamie leaving? Like Mike would have been, the, the, you know, not the first on the list. <laughs> so, yeah. Right, right. Yeah. So as, as the remaining four had a discussion together about this? No, we have not. No, it's, it's, well, it'll be interesting to see how this evolves. Uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm very open-minded about it largely because of like the history that I just shared. Like I, I, I don't know that I can reliably predict whether this is going to lead to success or, or, you know, ultimate success or ultimate failure. Um, so I'm, I'm open-minded but, about it, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm walk skeptical. Walk me through that open-mindedness about it. So, yeah. so this, does Russ need to step up and say, no, damn it. Fling is an ongoing thing. It's a good thing. We got the four of us. We'll get a new, like, does someone need to lead through this darkness? Yeah. Russ, and, and, Russ is definitely know. leading through this darkness. He, he has a vision he, and, and he's even said, he's like, I'm, I'm excited to see where this takes us, you know, as just a four piece. I, I think there's, you know, creating extra space in the music might actually be a good thing for some songs and, and the direction of some songs that we've been writing and like that kind of stuff. So it's not, it's not like an instant death knell. Like it would be, well, I was going to say, if you had a band with a very, you know, distinctive lead singer and then they left the band, like, you know, Bon Scott or whatever. Right. But like that, that band did, phenomenally well after they replaced Bon Scott, which seems impossible, right? right? You, you know, so, uh, but, but it, 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 David Lee Roth, David Lee Roth. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Some people would, would actually argue that, that Van Halen did end when David Lee Roth left. I, I, I disagree with that. I like, I liked everything they did with Sammy. I liked everything they did with Dave. I, I, I don't exist in only one camp on that, but that's, uh, but that is also another story. So yeah, I like, I'm not, I'm, I'm open-minded about it, but I'm, but I've been sort of, but you're going to wait and see, you're, you're going to see how it involves and what Russ, you know, preaches and you'll have an opinion about this. So this is where it's that kind of blend of someone needs to say something. Yeah. And, right. So, yeah. you know, it, the de facto leader or the official leader, someone has to say, here's the plan. And then everybody has to say, yeah. Yeah. Let's try the plan. You know that, yeah, that, yeah. And that's kind of where we are is everybody's like, all right, let's try the plan. That's fine. Like, let's see, let's see what happens. I, y- yeah, I'm, I'm curious. I'm curious. You know, or you, and the interesting thing that resonates with me is you talk about how successful fling was. And, you know, I, I think about the house rockers and, you know, we, we had one guy retire just because the pace was, he mm-hmm. just couldn't do that. Yeah. We had one guy, again, a longtime member, give me basically two weeks notice and he moved out of state, right? Like, you know, we had a conversation about it. He felt bad that he couldn't give more notice. But I mean, literally this ongoing band that put a lot of money in his pocket was about as as working a band as you could ask for. Sure. And in two weeks he was gone and like, sorry, you figured out, right? Yep. So, and we figured out, you know. Yeah, and, yeah things um, move on. That's the thing is things, I, I, I've watched bands suffer you know, the loss of a member and it, and then you look even, you know, six weeks later and it's like, what, what happened? You know, nothing. I don't think that's going to be the case with fling where, you know, fling is very much a band that is the by, a byproduct of its members. So this will have a change, uh, like a, a material change on what fling is like, just like when, when Burke left and we eventually brought Jamie Bradley in, like th- there was a change and, I, some people may argue it was a change for the better. Some people may argue it was a change for the worse. I, I, I actually, I don't know that I have an opinion on that one way or another, but it's, it's definitely a change. We, we went from having a bass player that uh, was very into like grooves and, and, you know, um, jam oriented material to a very pop oriented bass player that is also an amazing songwriter. Uh, you know, so, and a great singer as well. So I, like it, it's a, it's a change and it, depending on what kind of music you like, you may say it's good. You may say it's bad. So, I, and I think that will, I, I think there will be a, a musical change with, with Mike's departure too. I know there will, because Mike was the one responsible for most of flings like high energy, you, you know, four chords and the truth kind of rockers. And, and so we won't, have those anymore one thing we need to decide is 
what, if any, uh, and, and we really don't, I don't know that anybody has a strong opinion on this, but which of Mike's songs do we keep in the, in the mm. fling set list and, and which do we sort of let go? And I, and I, like we need to have that conversation. It, the beautiful thing is that there is zero bad blood here. Like no, it, it wasn't like yeah. you guys screwed me. F you like there was like zero. And in fact, it was kind of the opposite of, of that. And as it has been throughout fling, like everybody really gets along and uh, certainly we have things we disagree about, but, but it's a, it's a very, mostly a very mature band. Um, we avoid, con cool. we avoid conflict more internally, more than is probably healthy, but, but that's the most unhealthy thing that we would do is, in fling is, you know, we like, could do a lot worse than that. Exactly. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. And it's, it's not even like to an extreme it's just if i have to pick one thing it's like well we probably should talk about things more you know but otherwise it's it's fine so um well i hear you tell your story and it kind of reflect on me and it's like all right well i've invested a lot over time you know and i think we built this brand we've survived the loss of some members yep um you know we keep on going we you know, now it is all bands are kind of organic things. There's different forces that pull on them, whether they're internal band members getting along, external life factors that band members, you know, encounter marriages, jobs, kids, totally. whatever it might be. I mean, you know, there you're, you are constantly one opportunity to disband away from disbanding, right? Like, you know, you could pick any day and, and, you know, like you said, one day could be great. The next day, like what happened? What happened? But, yeah. Well, like Timothy B. Yeah. Schmidt said, every band is on the verge of breaking up at all times. And, 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 yeah. and little Steven had a similar thing to say, you know, so, yep. Right. Yep. But, but it shouldn't be though. You know, actually that's that, you know, like when I think about things that I've experienced in our group, our group is a good situation. Yep. Quality gigs, quality pay. People treated like professionals, you know, no assholes, you know, you know, ripping at people's, you know, personal issues or anything like that. Right, right. Yeah. Yet it's, yet it's interesting to me that there is some natural, you know, nuclear reaction that <laughs> that that makes that what Timothy B. Schmidt said true. It shouldn't be. Like, no, you're right. It shouldn't be. Why, leave, why would you want to leave it? Why would you want to leave the Eagles? The right? Eagles why of all bands. Like that band was on top, literally on top of the world. Like they, like they, they had that. He said that while being filmed and being interviewed en route from one gig to another in the Eagles private plane. Like it, it couldn't have been much better than that. And this was a guy that had just been brought into the band, right? He was playing in Poco for 400 bucks a week or whatever. And then it was like, oh, Randy Meisner's out. You're up, buddy. You know, right. and and yet he he took it in stride because, you know, it's like, well, it's as just a how given. it is. It's, 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 it's a given. It yeah. Right. It's, it's like, and yep. As a band leader, I have had to ride a long roller coaster of, I want everybody to be brothers in this band. Let's all get along. Let's let's be close because it'll be you know more meaningful to make music with people that you like that much. And over time, like if, you know, again reflecting on your your story, I don't know in your adult life if that's necessarily healthy. It's certainly pleasant if it can be. Yeah. But if you take that along with the fact that every band is you know one incident from breaking up, <laughs> it makes more sense for it to be as an adult. Just, just everybody be cool, show up, do your job and, you know, not, it, it's a, it's a risky business plan if you base your entire business on, on, you know, one soloist or one singer or anything like that. That's, yeah. that is, that is, you know, just a, a, a fail, failing proposition. Well, it's, so and, it, and group, I mean, even just like in, in terms of like mental health or emotional health, I like. This idea that you're involved in this thing that you are both committed to, certainly from a time standpoint, probably from an emotional standpoint, and and at, potentially from a financial standpoint, depending on how your band fits into the rest of your like revenue stack and all that stuff, and to know that this thing could just go away at any point in time because of some factor 
that not only can you not control, but you probably can't predict other than knowing that it's always lurking around the corner. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it's just not, you're right. It's not healthy at all. But here we are not only accepting it for ourselves, but acknowledging that the entire business of this music thing that, that we talk about accepts it as just fact. It's like, oh yeah, it's how it goes. <laughs> so maybe, maybe yeah. that's why, you know, when you asked me before, like, well, did you see this coming? It's like, well, I mean, kind of because I kind of have to, but I didn't see this specific well, thing coming, I, you know, <laughs> I meant more like, I know, like yeah. if you all saw it coming eight months ago, no. And then everybody in the band somewhat internalizes what it means to them. Like, oh, here we go. He's going to quit. Band's going to, you know, I might as well get out now. Yeah, like a, yeah, a bunch yeah. of stuff can can roll downhill if it's not, you know, kind of, if there's not good communication in the band. In my group, if, if so Nick has this, this other project that, you know, is taking yeah. his time and, and, uh, you know, I've never, I think Nick has missed one gig in 25 years because of something, you sure. know, sickness or something like that. So, you know, he sings about 35, 40% of the show. I sing about 35, 40% of the show. And then some combination of Chris and Simon sing the rest, right? Yeah. Nick would be hard to replace. Oh, what yeah. What am I going to do? It would, if, if, it would what, change. Well, the, what would I do? It would change the nature of the house rockers if, but, if Nick Like left. you said, it would, it would have to evolve. It, but well, it would have left. It's, yeah. But wait a second. It's not just left, right? So, again, in this world of adult musicians where... People like playing in two or three groups and people like doing their solo stuff and therefore are not available. I, I think I, the flip side to, you know, a band is always, you know, one thing away. The question is, what would you do? Right. So everybody who's listening, yeah. what would you do if you lost player A, B, C, D, E, or F or G, right? If I couldn't play with Nick, which I would hate to have to do. Well, I got none of other guys who want to work. I want to work. Right. So, you know, just folding it up doesn't seem like a very smart option to me. Yep. Um, you know, we would have to try something else. Would it work as well? You know, Nick is awesome. And it, 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 I, the best I could hope for is that it would work, but differently. Right. And, you know, then you get the questions, hey, where's Nick or where's so and so? Right. And so when you build a brand and you try and build an audience and get people to come, I mean, that's a that's a complicated thing. And that's why trying to keep people on the same page about the commitment to, you know, having a band ongoing, you know, is a is a useful thing for everybody. So you can build your band as a bunch of replaceable parts. You can build your band with a bunch of plan B's. If so-and-so doesn't show, we'll yep. play these songs. I think it's probably a healthy thing to know, you know, if your plan B's have any life to them, right? Rather than a change has come, that's it let's fold it up or it changes come or like everybody's looking at each other, what, what they're going to do. Right. As opposed to just, you know, what are you going to do? I, I, the point of it all is it's useful to ask the question, what would you do? It is. I, you at said, any, you, at any, go ahead. At any point in your band's life. Yeah. What would you do? What would, what would, what would fling do if you couldn't make a gig the day of cancel or sub? And I'm not saying there's a right or wrong answer. No, but it's a question to, to like, well, yeah, I mean, at some level, it's good to sort of explore those what ifs at another level. It's super unhealthy to obsess over them. Right. So you gotta, you gotta balance oh, absolutely. that. Right. Right. But, but you said before, everybody likes to play in multiple projects. And I, I want to dissect that a little bit. Uh, there's certainly, I am someone who, who plays in multiple projects. Part of that. And and certainly the the stated reason and the the conscious reason for that is I like to fulfill my musical uh, desires, right? Like I, no one project sort of does everything, and so I like to have different outlets to do different things with, right? You know, uh, Monkey Fist is one thing, and flings another and bitter pills another. And then, you know, every now and then I pick up a theater gig and that like, you know, gets into the cerebral part of it where I'm reading and like, you know, dissecting and creating this, you know, temporary piece of art that we do. And then it's over. Um, so that is the stated reason. That's the sort of top of mind conscious reason that I play in multiple projects. 
but is one of the, you know, very just underneath the surface reasons. Is it the fact that I know that any one of these things could just fall out from under me and I know how bad it would be for me and my emotional health if I didn't have an outlet to play with? Like, is that part of why I like playing with multiple projects? And I, I don't, I, I think the answer is probably yes. I haven't really stopped to think about this until this very moment as we're sort of pulling all of this together. But I, like, I think that's, I, I definitely think that's a part of it. Like that's, and, and maybe that's a part of it. I can't speak for other musicians, but I can certainly project and I'm the one with the microphone. So I get to do that. Right. Is that part of the reason why all of us or many of us like playing in multiple projects to, you know, hedge our bets. Is that part of it? Probs. Cause we know what Timothy yeah. B. Schmidt knows. Like this isn't, this wasn't yeah, news sure. to anyone when he said that, uh, you know, anyone who's ever played in a band, when you hear that, like every band's on the verge of breaking up at all times, you don't go, wow, that's a surprise. You nod your head because you know that it's a truth. It's not just truthy. It is literally a truth. <laughs> so I think it's also, I think it's also a self-fulfilling prophecy. I, I don't disagree you, with if that. If you live in if you live in that frame of mind, mm -hmm. you're you're wishing it to come into being. Well, and that's what I'm saying about it not being healthy to obsess about what if this person, what if that person, at some point, you do need to throw trust into the equation. And I, I definitely find myself doing this and then it scares me a little bit, but I I, you know, try to do it anyway. You know, when I when I first started playing with Fling, it was like, oh, I'm just the guy that shows up, they have plenty of people, they can do this with or without me, this is great. Uh, and then as as things evolved, it was like I started becoming more integrated into the songs. There were songs that they probably wouldn't do if I wasn't there, you know, that kind of thing. And then it's like, oh, well, now I now I have a responsibility to this thing that could fall apart at any minute. <laughs> you know, it's so it's like, what have I gotten myself into? And as I'm saying that, I realized, you know, with Bitter Pill, it it was the same thing, right? Like, I mean, I was part of the first thing that was called Bitter Pill. And then and then they did, they sort of evolved it into a gigging band without drums for the first, whatever, year and a half of that. And then they asked me to come in and they were like, yeah, we want, to, we want you to play this one gig. And then it was like, we'd love you to play the second gig with us. And then it was play any gig you, anytime you see a gig on our calendar, you are welcome to be there. Just let us know. And, but even at that point it was, but I don't have to go. There was no commitment, but I liked it. Obviously I like playing with this band. I like playing with these people. They're really good people. And we're obviously great musicians and great songs. And so I, I went to all the gigs. I, I carved it out of my schedule. I made it happen. And you know, you, you go four years, five years. And then it's like, oh, well now when I can't make a gig, it screws up the set list. And like, it's, I have yeah. a responsibility to this. Like I, I felt bad that I wasn't there Thursday night. So like it definitely, even, even when you, when you think you're in a scenario where it's like, oh, I have the best of both worlds. I can just be Dave and do whatever I want. That's not really, that's not how I am. I like to be integrated into a band. I'd like to be part of a band. And, yeah. and that comes with that risk of, well, but if somebody else craters the band, well, then I'm not part of that band anymore. Cause that band doesn't exist. Right. You know, or, well, that's it. So yeah. But I, I'll just kind of close this conversation from my perspective. Like, with this thought. So one of my guys sent me a note saying, hey, I have a couple of dates next year, 2024, yep. that I'm not going to be available. And one was date X and one was date Y, along with a note, you know, my family is doing something, right? Okay. And so I, I sent back a note saying, is the other date a, mu a musical conflict? Uh... And th the answer was, the answer was, yes, someone has asked me to do something um, is it a problem uh, or, or do we have anything, you know, brilliant it's, again, it's, it's for next October, I think. And I, I said, well, you know, here's what typically happens in that moment. And I just, here's my gospel. I just lay it out every time, even though everyone in the band has heard it every time I, I lay it out again, I, I'm like, listen, if all 10 guys in this band pick one, two or three dates a year where they want to go do something else. And either that means that we can't work or we're going to have a sub and therefore we're less good than we can be. We really don't have, you know, a, a reliable group to put on stage every day. Right. Yeah. You know, and this was, a, this was the rhythm section player where it's really hard to, to sub our rhythm section guys. And I was like, you know, if, 
if, if I have to turn something down now because you're not going to be available, I have five guys in this band that make their living from, from playing in the house. You know, part of it comes from gigging in the house rockers. They can't work that night or they may not work that work night. And, you know, that's, that's a tough thing. If I had 10 guys doing this and we were turning down a lot of gigs, those guys are going to go find something else to do, right? Yep. Or, or everyone's going to find something else. So it is, th- this supports Timothy B. Schmidt's, you know, premise, like the, the, the very fragile thread that holds a group together is based on the common commitment. So what we've always said is, you know, you got to really know who you're getting into bed with when you ask a guy to join your band. Does he have the same commitment level? Have you told him what's expected in terms of when you can take something else or any of those types of things? I'm not saying that there's a right or wrong. I'm just simply saying if it's not if it's not clearly understood the implications of of uh, saying I can't do a gig. Some bands are like, hey, uh, we got a gig offer. Everybody available? Yes, good, no, good. You know, and, every, and, and no that's, problem. that works that's for right. everybody. Yep. yep. That's good. I know to keep my band together, if I don't keep my band working, they will get busy with other stuff. Yep. And, and, uh, and it'll create different types of problems. So working through, you know, my, my plan Bs and plan Cs, you know, I have, I have good sub lists. I can sub horn players. But, you know, I have a couple of guys in my horn section who are really great performers. When they don't show up, at, yes, I can find a very good player to replace them. But, you know, when someone That's comes different. up to the band and says, hey, yeah. where's so-and-so? You know, I came to see so-and-so. And you're like, oh, he, you know, couldn't make it tonight. Or, oh, you know, he's not with us tonight. And and if if you build a band based around, you know, wanting people to know your your band and connect with your band, but it's a different product every time you go. It's like, it's like you know, if, if if every McDonald's was a hit or miss as to whether it would be good or not, that wouldn't be very good for the McDonald's brand, right? If you That's never true. knew what you were going to get to. That's okay. the consistency. Yeah, consistency is their business. Like, yeah. you know, you're going to get, think, you're gonna get burgers of, of that quality and clean bathrooms. Like that's, you know, right. that's McDonald's. Yeah, so, man. So to close this, we, we, you know, when, it, when Mike departs, how much will people come up and say, where's Mike? I, lo- I loved hearing him. And, you know, do you ready to answer that question? There will be no small contingent of people for whom that is true. Yeah. I, yeah. yeah. It's it, like, I, in my mind, Mike is slash was an integral part of the fling sound, the fling presentation, the fling machine. Is there, can I envision a world where there's a band that is, you know, the remaining four members of fling that calls itself fling? Yeah. Is it mm-hmm. fling to me? I don't know. Like I haven't heard that band play to be perfectly candid, right? Like this is all very fresh. So we have not gotten together and, and jammed or anything and, and like played through stuff. I can't remember the last time we jammed without Mike. So, you know, I, I really don't have a vision of what that would be like. Um, so yeah. And, and then, and then it's not just musically, it's the energy of it all, right? Each person brings a different element in and, and there's going to be, it's going to feel like we're flying in the missing man formation, no matter what, like for a while and, and maybe forever. So I don't know, but then, then and and this is probably the part that I I don't know if I should have been talking about any of this, but this is the part I definitely shouldn't be talking about. But I'm gonna it then there's the part of like it's like, okay, well, if if this does mean that Fling is going to sort of you know, w- whether it fizzles out or simmers down to a, being a non-gigging outfit, maybe Fling just becomes a, a recording unit. It's like, well, that then then it's like, oh well, that's kind of nice. It's less contention for, you know, my time for bitter pill gigs, which is you know, there's a lot of those and we really, you know, that band's kind of firing on all cylinders. And so is that a good thing? I don't like, I like on the surface, you know, looking at it through, through, you know, those lenses. Yeah. Maybe that's, maybe this is great. You know, I don't know. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. It's interesting. Yep. Yeah. So I'll keep everybody posted, you know, we'll see how it goes. It. I, I, yeah, I, I think there's a world where the, where, you know, there's, a a new energy to fling being this four piece thing. And who knows, maybe it, it doesn't remain a four piece. There, there's like, 
I'm just throwing out all the possibilities. There's been, I mean, there's barely been discussion about when to get together to, to jam as the four of us. There's been no discussion about, should, you know, should there be a fifth thus far? It's like, well, let's just try this as the four of us and see how it goes. And I, I don't think, yeah. we, I don't think we need to replace Mike, but maybe a year from now, that, that's a different conversation. I don't know. I, you know, I'll tell happens. you what, I, I know I don't get a vote, but if I had a vote, I would say if you built something that means something to the people who come listen to you, do whatever you can to keep it moving forward. You know, it's good advice. Either, either replace or create something new as a four piece or whatever yeah. it's going to be. Yeah. But a fling and you have 80, you know, or, you know, you and you and, and Russ and, um, and, and, and he, I guess your base, yeah. but yeah. yeah, I mean, the core, the core of you that's been there for so many years, building something that means something to people. Why would you let that just go up into the ether? I, that just doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah. I don't, I don't want to like, as you're saying that it's like, no, I, I really enjoy uh, you know, playing music with those guys and playing the music that we create as, as fling. I enjoy playing that with those guys. But w when I say that I'm still including Mike in that, cause I've never played that music without him. So I like, I want to see what that's like. I need to see what that's like. And it turns out I will have to see what that's like. So we'll see where it goes. Yeah. Good luck, brother. Thanks man. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be, uh, it'll be interesting. We got anything else, man. Good. Heading yep. to a rehearsal. You're you're heading off to rehearsal. Nice. Well, have yep. a uh, yep. have a great rehearsal. Whether it's rehearsal or a gig or even a podcast. Do you have any advice that might fit all three of those things, Paul? Just in general, I'd say always be performing. That's good advice. Yeah.